So hello. Um, this is a lecture on, uh, for DAC 1311 Counseling Theories, and we're going to be talking about um, uh, person-centered counseling today and uh, some of the other uh, uh, spin-off uh, type of theories that are associated with it. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, the originators of uh, these theories and how they apply uh, to the substance abuse field. Uh, every, uh, every one of the theories that we've looked at thus far and the ones that we'll look at, uh, you know, moving ahead into the future, uh, all have uh, some relevance to substance abuse counseling, even, uh, even uh, you know, psychoanalysis gave us a language and things like ego defenses and stages of psychosexual stages of development and that kind of thing. Uh, the uh, one we're going to look at today has had a tremendous impact on uh, substance abuse counseling, and that's um, the person-centered approach that was first uh, uh, developed by Carl Rogers and his daughter Natalie and researchers who came along after that, which would have pleased Rogers to no end because he had um, uh, intended and hoped that uh, people would take up his uh, client-centered counseling, his person-centered approach, and uh, elaborate on it as time went on. He was pretty sure he didn't have all the answers, and he was, you know, correct in that assumption. Um, so this is one that, uh, this is an approach that has been used and has been used effectively uh, working with uh, alcoholics. And a derivative, a spinoff of this, one that was uh, uh, modified uh, motivational interviewing, was developed by Stephen Miller and um, Dr. Stephen Miller and uh, Dr. Uh, 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 I mean Stephen Rolnick and Dr. Stephen Miller, uh, specifically for working with clients, resistant clients, uh, alcoholics, chemically dependent people. They had them in mind when they came up with motivational interviewing. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you, uh, and we'll look at the PowerPoint and uh, run through some of the high points of this. You're also supposed to be reading your chapters, right? You know that, so that you're not relying solely on these little interviews, uh, little lectures. Uh, chapter 7, Person-Centered Counseling. And that is Carl Rogers. Uh, and he uh, has a humanistic approach to uh, uh, counseling, which we'll talk about in just a second. A quote from Carl Rogers, of many. I mean, this guy's a very quotable person. He's said a lot of profound things that uh, occasionally I like to just grab something that he said and post it on Facebook, give, something, uh, give people something to chew over, you know, <laughs> they're not doing anything better. Uh, if I were to search for the central core of difficulty in people as I've come to know them, it is that in the great majority of cases, they despise themselves, regarding themselves as worthless and unlovable. And dear hearts, you will certainly find that in uh, our uh, pro in our profession. You'll the, you'll find it all over our society, our country, our world. We're surrounded by diamonds who are convinced that they're lumps of coal. Was uh, Carl Rogers a quiet revolutionary? That's what uh, he has been called by a number of people, including. Dr. Gerald Corey, who wrote the book that uh, I'm lecturing you on tonight. Rogers held a lot of interest, and he pursued them all. And uh, he came from a, 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 you know, from a background that was steeped in religious Protestant work ethic. Uh, play was discouraged at his house. Uh, uh, work was encouraged, being serious, uh, you know, being a, uh, of a, a sober, sound mind was very important. Uh, 
he grew up in the country. His first major was agriculture, and uh, he uh, pursued it. Then he pursued history, then religion, and finally he uh, settled on clinical psychology. Uh, and that's, he took it from there. Uh, like others, he both studied and rejected Freudian models of development. Uh, as we said, you know, in the very first week of this class, Freud, someone that um, everyone who goes into this field, everyone who goes into a counseling field has to uh, contend with uh, because he was an important thinker. Just like in, um, uh, if you're studying theology, you've got to tackle Nietzsche at some point in St. Augustine. Uh, anyway... His theories of personality development and his insistence that good counselors did not really need any additional training beyond the honest relationship really rocked the counseling world, and this was revolutionary. Uh, Carl Rogers believed that uh, if you had certain qualities, that was really all you needed to be an effective counselor. Uh, that, uh, you know, and, and he, he was an academic. He was uh, an intellectual. He certainly wasn't someone who uh, uh, discounted being bright. He, he did discount the training that we got and the needs for diagnoses and things like that. Uh, and his philosophy is humanism, uh, and it's of acorns and oak trees. And uh, you probably heard this analogy before. I know I used it in another lecture, but I don't remember which one. Uh, and that uh, uh, contained within an acorn is everything it needs to turn into an oak tree if con certain conditions are met, met. You don't have to uh, do anything spectacular. Leave it to itself, and it will become an oak tree. And the humanistic approach has a very positive view of human nature and development, that we have within us the same mechanisms as an, as an acorn does to become an oak tree. Uh, that uh, I don't, uh, if the way is open for me to, to develop and to become what I'm supposed to be, I will. Uh, this counseling is, uh, approach of Rogers is also somewhat anti-intellectual. Uh, I'm not saying that he is necessarily anti-intellectual, but he doesn't believe that you need a whole lot of special training in order to be a good and effective uh, counseling. He also hasn't much use for diagnoses. Uh, that uh, diagnosis is something that uh, is important for counselors and medical people and doctors and nurses. It doesn't mean much to the patient. Uh, and uh, we'll get into that a little later on. This is also uh, an approach that is supportive and affirming, uh, and the relationship is the transformative thing that happens that makes people better. Uh, when two folks are in psychological contact and trust each other, and I'll talk, go through the steps in a, in a little while, uh, we both change, we both grow, we both come out different people. We have to focus on the quality of the relationship. And studies have indicated uh, that he was pretty spot on with that. Uh, if we look at all of these different theories and all these different theorists that we've looked at so far, these brilliant people, uh, when you get right down to it, uh, the thing that predicts a positive outcome in most counseling approaches is the intensity and quality of the relationship. Come back to that later, too. There were four periods of development in person-centered uh, therapy, and this goes back to the 40s. In 1942, uh, while World War II was still going on, as a matter of fact, non-directive counselor, well, at that time, uh, uh, Carl Rogers uh, was a professor, uh, and uh, he was working on his non-directive counseling, uh, and uh, is which is a, a a focus on a permissive and non-directive climate, and to, which allows change to take place. Uh, you know, you look at bonsai trees and uh, uh, things like that; they can only grow 
to the extent that whoever's forming them allows them to grow. They're kept small purposefully. Once upon a time, I was driving uh, out in the Permian Basin uh, and uh, uh, near Monahans, and there are a lot of white sand dunes out there if you've ever been driving around through West Texas. And I was driving through there and I was looking off at these little scrubby looking bushes off of the sand dunes. And I was thinking, man, those look like oak trees, little oak trees. And I, anyway, there were a lot of them. And I pulled over and went out there and looked. And sure as hell, they were little oak trees. Uh, it wasn't one of them uh, that reached my chin, you know. Uh, they had acorns on them. Uh, they had part of what they needed to develop as, as an oak tree. The climate didn't allow for much more. They were growing in sand, not good soil, not conducive to oak trees. Uh, they didn't get much rain because it was in the desert. It's dry out there, you know. Sun, they got plenty of that. Uh, and some of them burn up from time to time. And I was in a very large oak forest that was just a, a bunch of little small trees uh, doing the best that they could uh, with what they had to work with. That's the nature of human beings. Most of the time, and this is Roger's theory on this, this is a humanist theory. Human beings do the best we can with what we have to work with. Sometimes the climate and the conditions for our growth doesn't, uh, doesn't allow much for us. Uh, and it's only when we uh, are able to expand those conditions uh, that we can uh, really prosper and thrive. The ch he challenges the role of counselor as a director, teacher, diagnostician, or any of that stuff. Uh, again, going because human beings don't really need to be taught how to be human beings or directed in uh, how to grow or taught uh, or diagnosed, in, in fact. And that di uh, diagnoses actually get in the way of effective counseling. That's revolutionary. In the 1950s, he came uh, into his second period that they call client-centered therapy. Uh, and that focused on the person rather than the process uh, or the problem. Uh, and the actualizing tendency, this innate drive to become more than we are, uh, was the primary focus. This is revolutionary. Uh, Freud and Jung and uh, Adler, you know, uh, uh, all talked about... Uh, uh, have it. Well, Freud and uh, Jung talked about uh, kind of, you know, reductionism, actually, uh, where, uh, you know, we're prisoners of our biology and all of that good stuff, and we're at the mercy of instinctual forces that we can't understand, all of that, uh, and that we have fixations or problems, and that these problems have to be worked through or resolved or whatever. That is not uh, a client-centered uh, uh, conceptualization by any stretch of the, uh, of the uh, imagination. Human beings, you and I, we are unique entities making our way uh, through a world where we cannot control, uh, uh, you know, the circumstances in which we live. We cannot control certain things in our lives. Uh, and, but we can uh, if we, uh, uh, and we don't have to. We, 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 problem solving is not what we're about. What we're about is becoming. Uh, and uh, I can transcend uh, my limitations uh, if the conditions are right for me. If I have, for instance, someone who connects with me who supports and listens to me, things like that. This is really important in substance abuse counseling too. Uh, what we bring to the table, well, any kind of counseling, let me rephrase that, is substance abuse counseling or any other kind of counseling. What we bring to the table, the most important thing we bring to the table is to listen 
uh, to what people have to say. It's not the things that we have to say uh, that makes the real difference in people's lives. It's what they discover about themselves and what they tell themselves. Uh, so consequently, you don't focus on, you know, uh, uh, you're a drug addict and let's teach you how to not be a drug addict. You focus on the individual and the processes that are going on within them, uh, their subjective world. You don't have to teach them anything about it. You just have to help them uh, find their way through it. In the late 50s through the 70s, the third period, uh, and actually I just talked about that, the focus on the necessary and sufficient conditions for therapy the, and the qualities of the counselor. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, the fourth period refocused on education, couples, families, industry, uh, and uh, uh, world peace, all kinds of things. He really, you know, set his sights on some loftier goals during uh, that period. His daughter uh, picked up on a lot of her father's uh, training, uh, but uh, and Natalie. Uh, uh, well, not his training, but his theories, let me put it that way. Uh, and uh, she um, uh, developed her own practice with that and her own theories around it. Uh, uh, and her, uh, her focus was on uh, incorporating person-centered philosophy into a, a practice that included, you know, art and music and uh, poetry and all that uh, painting and that kind of stuff. Uh, but she came angrily to a feminist standpoint. She relentlessly challenged the boundaries placed in her way as a female in a male-dominated society and profession. Uh, she was as smart as any of her contemporaries. She was as gifted, as creative, as professional, uh, but at the time she was born and growing up, uh, you know, women had, um, had to bump their heads on that glass ceiling a lot. Uh, and so, uh, and she influenced her father. Uh, I mean, you know, he's the kind of guy that was able uh, to change in that respect. When we talk about... Uh, you know, where people's, uh, where people's uh, uh, theories come from and how, how their lives, especially their early lives coming up. We, we looked at how Freud was a Jew growing up in an anti-Semitic Vienna, etc., and how that shaped his thinking and his uh, uh, perceptions of the world. Uh, same held true with Natalie. Uh, same held true with Carl uh, when he was growing up. Uh, once upon a time, and I, if I'd have thought about it, I'd have looked it up and posted that too, uh, but I didn't. Uh, the, once upon a time, he was asking an interview, uh, you know, here's this guy who uh, is, uh, you know, got a degree in agriculture. He studied engineering. He studied history. He's done all this marvelous stuff. He created uh, this uh, uh, client-centered approach to counseling. He's car carried it over the course of his entire career. His daughter picks it up, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but uh, uh, once upon a time, he was asked by someone who was writing a story on him, uh, you know, what do you think would be, uh, what do you think uh, if your mother would say, and by this time his mother was dead, uh, what do you think your mother would be most proud of, of all your accomplishments? And uh, Dr. Rogers answered, I don't think my mother would ever take anything I had done seriously, that she'd be proud of anything I'd ever done. Uh, and if you look at the thinking and the elements that his approach to counseling hinge on, unconditional positive regard, empathy, being able to put yourself in a place uh, and understand another person's subjective reality, uh, uh, being real, being genuine with people, uh, you might see where that comes from. Because uh, 
very often uh, people are struggling to gain an acceptance that they're never uh, they're never going to get. No one's ever stopped to admire them. All their relationships have had conditions uh, placed on them. Uh, Roger's life was uh, uh, if uh, it, like the little kids whose parents were out for the evening and they decided they had surprised them by cleaning the house, right? And mom comes back home and the kids are all set, standing there in a the line, proudly waiting to be praised. And she walks over to the bookshelf and puts her finger on the top and drags it across and looks at it and says, looks like someone forgot to dust. And there you have it. That's uh, where people start getting a little crushed early on in life. Now, we don't have to go back and try to resolve these problems, uh, but what we do is try not to crush our clients <laughs> when we're working with them, but to, to value them in a non-possessive way just because they are. And that's it, yeah, just because they are. And that doesn't mean that we have to value uh, what they're doing or how they're doing it or their behavior or anything, but to value them uh, as individuals. Uh, this is Dr. Leslie Greenberg. Uh, he uh, also uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a humanist uh, counselor. Uh, he helps clients uh, recognize a need uh, and employs methods to help clients increase their awareness of uh, their emotions and uh, to make productive use of them. He shares that uh, focus with the Gestalt therapist, with Fritz Perls and, and, uh, uh, and Pol the pollsters and the rest of that group, uh, that emotions are um, integral to human uh, health, to human behavior, to human psychology, to human development, etc. Uh, also, emotions are, period. They just are. Uh, and uh, some theorists don't think it's, well, they think it's uh, to call them good emotions or bad emotions is erroneous and, uh, and uh, you know, mistaken. That uh, feelings are just feelings. Anger helps you sometimes. Anger's good sometimes. Sadness helps you sometimes. Sadness is good sometimes. Uh, these things are not always pleasant. Fear is a good emotion to have, you know. So that when the uh, when the, uh, the the sick coyote bounces out of the bushes, coming at you, grinning from ear to ear, you can respond in a proper way, you know, uh, to to that threat, fear, anger, uh, all of that. But sometimes those emotions overwhelm us. Uh, the good ones and the bad ones. Uh, and uh, But we're not helpless victims of those emotions. We, we have a say in them. Uh, and uh, Greenberg uh, uses uh, person-centered uh, techniques and person-centered approaches. He also believes that, uh, you know, being real, being genuine, sharing what you're feeling with the client while you're feeling it during the session, and that immediacy that's always now uh, is uh, an effective method of helping uh, the clients uh, to do the same and become healthy. With me so far? Okay, I'm gonna slow it down a little bit. I felt, I kind of felt like I was rushing things. Existentialism and humanism, uh, they are very similar uh, and they are essentially different. Uh, it's confusing to, to divide these two out. They have lots of similarities, but they have some key differences. The, the similarities are both respect subjective experience. Remember, subjective experience is the client's world, as the client lives it, and as the client sees it. Uh, and both uh, trust the client to direct 
his or her life. I mean, it is his or her life, and uh, they are the experts, and they do know what they want, and they do understand their experience, and they do have goals and desires, etc., and so forth. So consequently, both humanistic and existential uh, uh, philosophy emphasize freedom, choice, autonomy, values, responsibility, and meaning, and creating meaning, and what's important for you, uh, and what's your priorities in the life, the one and only life that you're living right now. Uh, and that is a responsibility of the individual. You and I are both responsible for that, right? And it doesn't matter if... Uh, uh, we die and go to heaven or to hell or to nowhere. It doesn't matter if we get reincarnated and live a hundred other lives. All of those are propositions in the future. What I'm most responsible for is the life that I'm living right here, right now, this minute, right? You too. A key difference between existentialism and humanism is existentialists take the position that we're terrified and conflicted because we have to choose. Remember that angst thing that Kierkegaard brought to the table? And we choose in the light of the awareness of the more tragic dimensions of existence. Uh, we're scared. Uh, you know, what does it mean? I don't want this kind of freedom I don't, because it has responsibility attached to it, etc., Humanists, on the other hand, uh, uh, have a much more positive idea that we have, in the, uh, we have a, uh, within us that positive impulse toward growth that's called an actualizing tendency, uh, that, we not, that we're excited about being able to choose. We're excited about being able to change. We embrace the idea that we uh, uh, make choices and we accept challenges and through those choices and challenges we become more than we are uh, and uh, we're hardwired to do that as far as the humanists are concerned. Oh, what? <laughs> What's it self-actualizing tendency? Uh, back to the acorn and the oak, right? Self-actualization is an innate drive within each of us. Every acorn has within it everything, everything it needs to become an oak if certain conditions are met. The conditions are air, water, soil, sunlight, and voila, the acorn becomes an oak tree. If the conditions continue to be met, then that newly sprouted seedling, that seedling that pops up out of the ground uh, gets larger and larger and larger and soon becomes a huge, beautiful tree uh, and hard to beat a oak tree for just being magnificent, right? Uh, it does not need to be encouraged. It does not need to be counseled. It does not need to be bargained with. It does not need to be directed, bribed, threatened, instructed, uh, you name it. Just have the conditions met. And every human being has the same actualizing tendency within him or her. I hear some bright squealing out there in the audience. Wait a minute, Bushart. What about original sin? You know, what about this curse that Adam and Eve put on us? Uh, you know, we're born in sin. Even Freud says that, you know, we're creatures at war with ourselves. Uh, and that our basic instincts are something that we have to overcome. James Madison wrote about it in, uh, when he was coming up with the Constitution of the United States, that if, you, if human beings were angels, if men's the way he put it, were angels, we wouldn't even need laws, but we're not angels. He was pretty right on with that. Uh, but given our circumstances, uh, most people do the best they can with what they got. They give it a shot. Uh, now, some people are beaten down by, uh, by everything, by their experiences, by life, by the conditions that they have to live under, etc., and so forth. But even then, if the way is open for them to advance and to, uh, and to uh, become more 
they'll take it. Counseling over coffee. Did I mention that uh, Rogers might have been a quiet revolutionary? Uh, how revolutionary is this? You don't need an LCDC license. You don't need to take my courses. You don't need to get a PhD. You don't need an LPC. You don't need to set for a board. You don't need anything to be a good counselor, except for three qualities. Rogers believed that some of the best counseling on planet Earth takes place between people who care about each other over a cup of coffee in a kitchen somewhere and they're in psychological contact and they value one another and they trust one another and they can empathize with one another and when that's taken place that's the most powerful human interaction on planet earth and it transforms everybody who participates in it wow and i thought we were just going to starbucks for a cup of if you have someone in your life right now who you can go sit down with a cup of coffee uh, and you can tell them what you're thinking, what you're feeling, how things are going with you, and they won't tell you, oh man, that's so screwed up, shit, you know, that's not how you're supposed to think, you know, they don't try to fix you, they don't tell you how messed up you are. They don't try to educate you. They listen to you, and they understand you, and they sit with you while you go through whatever it is you're going through right now. Man, that's invaluable. Uh, you put them in your foot locker and keep them there, you know, because uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a very worthwhile friend. Uh, they won't be disgusted or put out with you or any of that stuff, they value you, they listen to you, uh, they don't judge you, and uh, you get better, and they get better, believe it or not. There are no particular skill, special skills needed because counseling is not about solving problems. When you get into diagnosis, that's more important to the counselors than the client. Uh, when I put stuff in my notes concerning diagnosis and prognosis and things like that, that's for other people. That's not for my client. That's for me to be able to talk to you guys who are my colleagues, you know, who are working on my treatment team. So that if you come along after I've gone on to do something else, you can pick up my chart notes and catch up what's going on with this client that you're taking over for. If I'm sending you a bill, and you're sitting in an office at an insurance company somewhere, this diagnosis and these progress notes and these prognoses and these uh, case summaries, etc., and so forth, that I'm expected to put together, and you will be expected to put together too. That's part of the job. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's important to other people. The client doesn't care. Well, maybe they care. Maybe they're interested. Maybe they understand, maybe they don't. When you do, and we'll talk about this a little later on, in motivational interviewing, the approach with the client, we may do something with clients uh, and work with them uh, uh, you know, on, on uh, issues that they're having, but we don't call them an alcoholic or a, a cocaine addict or any of that. Uh, is that an important thing? Sure, for billing purposes. Is it an important thing for this type of counseling? Not really. Uh, it doesn't matter what you call them, what you label them, because this approach is going to be transformative no matter if you call them something or if you don't call them something. If you say they have this, if you say don't, they have that. In fact, diagnostic labels can get in the way because I'm really trying to trim people around so they'll fit in a preconceived box, you know. Uh, and if I was, that's, and you, it's hard to get around that, you know. Uh, and when you begin labeling people and putting them into these categories, then you begin to respond to them categorically uh, rather than having a, a, a unique interaction. That, uh, that especially that unique transformative interaction. 
So human qualities bring about change through relationship. And this is all person-centered. It's uh, very existential. Uh, Gestaltists embrace a lot of this. So it's not something that's, uh, you know, that's isolated or unheard of. Two persons are in psychological contact. That means I have to be there with you. I have to connect with you. I have to have some kind of rapport with you. Uh, And the rapport happens this way. The client is in a state of incongruence. Something is unbalanced with you. Your insides don't match your outsides. Where you would like to be in your life and where you are is... uh, is, is distant. Uh, uh, you are having identity issues. You are having problems relating to yourself, uh, uh, for instance. The counselor is congruent. That doesn't mean I've got all my issues resolved, but that means that I'm congruent, that I am genuine, that I'm authentic in that moment, uh, that I'm working with the client. My insides do match my outsides. I'm not sitting there acting out some kind of role with the client. I'm being myself with them. I am uh, experiencing that unconditional regard for the client. And it doesn't say I am faking unconditional positive regard for the client. It says, I experience unconditional positive regard for the client. And I have to get there with that. One of my uh, mentors back in the day, when I first got into the counseling business, one Zaglinda Voise, uh, uh, went to school at... uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater. And uh, uh, she said that when she got through with her studies, and she stud- she was a Gestaltist, she leaned towards uh, Gestalt, uh, she went to work, uh, did a clinical uh, practicum uh, with a, a doctor who ran a psychiatric uh, ward uh, there near campus. And uh, uh, he got them in there, the uh, there was a handful of uh, students that were all going to be working for this guy. It was signed to him, and he asked them, was there any particular type of client they felt uncomfortable about working with that they didn't want to have anything to do with? And so Glenda says, yeah, I don't, I don't want to work. I don't want to have anything to do with sex offenders, you know, child molesters. I, I don't like them. I'm uncomfortable around them. I don't want to work with them. Uh, and he noted that in uh, you know his notes and stuff, and she said, you know, for the next three weeks, that's all I got uh, was sex offenders and child molesters and rapists and and what have you. And she said, uh, it just you know, it totally creeped me out, but I got used to it, you know. Uh, and then uh, so when I had my first, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think he, she had like three or four. Uh, consultations with this guy over the course of a semester. She said, when I had my first consultation uh, with him, he asked me some questions and took some notes. And then he asked me, uh, uh, do you have any questions for me? And she told him, yeah, I do. Uh, You know, you asked me on my very first day here, is there a group of people uh, or a group of clients, is there a population of clients I didn't want to work with and I told you yes, and I said it was sex offenders, and that's almost all you've given me is sex offenders. Uh, He goes, yeah. And she said, well, why are you doing that? And he said, to give you an opportunity to remove whatever is in the way of you working with these people who need your help. You know, it's not about them, uh, Miss Voicey. It's about you, (laughs) you know. You experience unconditional regard for the person, not for the person's behavior. There's a significant difference there. The counselor experiences empathy and tries to communicate this for the client. Empathy is uh, is, uh, uh, getting into the client's subjective experience and putting yourself in their place and trying to understand their their particular uh, phenomenal reality, their subjective reality. Put yourself in the world as they see it. 
and, and understand that and communicate that back to the client. Empathy is a good thing to have because empathy is understanding, uh, but, and, and that's, that's helpful. Uh, but it's most helpful when you can give it back to the client in a way that they get that you get it. Uh, and if they get it that you get it, and even if they get it that you're trying to get it, uh, then they'll, they'll work with you. Uh, think about it. Suppose uh, uh, you're working with someone who misunderstands everything you try to tell them. And they say, well, oh, that must, uh, that must have scared you. Well, no, it didn't scare me. It annoyed me. Oh, well, that must have been frustrating. No, it wasn't frustrating. It made me angry. That's what annoyance is, uh, you know. And after a while, if they keep getting it wrong, it, it might dawn on you, why am I talking to this person? Uh, they're not understanding the thing that I'm telling them. So a communication of empathy and unconditional regard has to a minimal degree be successful. Uh, I don't have a hard formula. It varies from people to people. But I would say, you know, somewhere around the area of maybe 70% of the time, you have to be right in uh, your attempts to be empathetic uh, with someone or, uh, or they may think, uh, yeah, this person isn't getting it. The counselor's best tool in this approach is the self. Uh, so that qualities for successful counseling is being real, being genuine, uh, being authentic. Uh, and that means, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm not hiding behind a role, you know. And it's tempting to do that, you know. Uh, uh, academics, counselor types, uh, you know, we stick a all of our degrees and certifications and stuff like that, as many as we can on our business cards and all over our walls so that when people come in, they can see that we're really good at earning degrees and certifications and stuff. And that uh, uh, should, uh, to some degree, uh, you know, uh, those credentials should impress them and give us some credibility, right? We also do that kind of stuff to intimidate people and to gain the upper hand and some power in the relationship. Uh, and uh, clients will do that too, uh, try to gain upper hands in the relationship. But that doesn't, uh, uh, that's not the insides matching the outside. That's not being real. That's not being genuine. That's not being authentic. That's playing a role. So, uh, I can't show you my hands. I'm so used to lecturing with my hands. I'm doing a little balance thing, and you can't see it because I've got my screen up. <laughs> Damn. I'm going to figure this out, how to do this simultaneously one of these days. Uh, but uh, uh, it's about balance. The uh, 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 When you come into to my office and you're the one who's incongruent, and who, who's experiencing some kind of problems, you're on my turf. I have, a, I have a little bit more of a powerful role in that relationship. Uh, and I can use that basically any way I want to, but if I'm being good at Roger, uh, Rogerian counseling, Rogerian counseling, I'm gonna try to get us equal as quick as I can so that we're uh, being collaborative. I'm not being authoritative or over-directive or any of that kind of stuff with you. Uh, and uh, we'll try to get on an even footing as, as quickly as we can. I will accept the client as being of worth. If you come in and sit across the desk from me, I'm on your side. I'm going to do what's in your best interest every chance I get. Uh, I will, uh, uh, you know, be honest with you. I will be loyal to you. That doesn't mean I accept every behavior that you have or that I'm willing to allow myself to be manipulated or any of that kind of stuff. But I value you as having innate self-worth. And this is a quality uh, that should be uh, non-possessive. You will have clients who will come in and try to intimidate you. They will intimidate you with language. They will intimidate you with body posture. They will intimidate you uh, with 
the way they look, the way they talk, etc., and they're trying to get some upper hand in the relationship. Uh, don't be intimidated. There are going to be people who come in and they're going to try to seduce you. Uh, and it will be men and it will be women and your gender doesn't matter. Uh, and they're going to try to win you over. And the reason they're doing this, dear hearts, is because they're freaked out. They're, they're, they're feeling a tad powerless in this relationship. Uh, and they're trying to gain some power uh, in it. So uh, you have to see beyond what they're doing and um, be cognizant of why they're doing it. Uh, I, I don't devalue people for doing this. I understand uh, what they're doing. They don't lose any of my unconditional positive regard. Uh, empathy. Uh, Ein Fillon, one feeling, uh, to deeply experience subjective reality as if it's my own without getting lost in it. That's important. Uh, an old friend of mine, uh, Kevin Thompson, used to say that if you lie down with psychotics, you wake up neurotic and vice versa. You know, if you uh, get so involved in your client's reality that you make it your own, you're in trouble. Uh, uh, empathy to a minimal degree must be accurate uh, and again is something that's, uh, that's not fake. You can be wrong uh, as long as you're being, as long as you're making an attempt. Uh, in fact, being wrong is very helpful sometimes because if you're engaged with the client, if you really have a good uh, rapport going on and you're in psychological contact and working in the now, immediately, you know, have an immediacy happening, uh, then the client's willing to work with you to correct you and help you understand what you're not understanding. And that's, uh, and then you're rocking and rolling in this, in this thing. The, the client should be doing most of the talking and the counselor's responses should be uh, to a minimum as well. Immediacy is the now. What's going on between us now? is what's important. Uh, the encounter is transformative for both uh, participants. It's very powerful when you do this. It will change you as well as your client. And if you don't want to change, maybe it's not too late to get into welding school or something. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it will be transformative. Uh, and that's marvelous. It's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, Person-centered approaches don't pay a lot of attention to assessment. Uh, now, if, if you go to work, and some of you may already be doing this, working out in a, uh, the field somewhere, uh, but, uh, uh, and if that's the case, then you know that, yes, by golly, if you're working for Good Place Treatment Center, assessment, screening, diagnostic impressions, treatment planning, you darn right that's important. Uh, and you're certainly going to do it. Uh, and that's true, you will. Uh, but uh, to deal with a client who's incongruent or who's even experiencing crisis right now, this isn't important. Uh, this approach does not focus on what constitutes the problem. The assessment is not particularly important. Uh, diagnostic labels get in the way. Uh, if someone calls you up, and this is the reason that Ro Rogerian uh, person-centered counseling is um, utilized a lot, say, in, in crisis situations, if you call suicide hotline, they're probably going to come at you uh, from a, a person-centered uh, approach. They're not going to ask you, uh, what's your name? Do you have insurance? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> they're not going to do uh, the background thing. How long have you been using drugs? You know, have you ever been arrested? Yada, yada, yada. Uh, no, they're going to, first of all, they want to know your name. You know, who are you? You're, you know, uh, and uh, I can hear that you're upset. Where are you? What are you doing right now? You know? Come on, step down off of the bridge rail. 
you know, they're going to work with you, uh, uh, with you, not with, uh, not with the problem that put you up there about to jump off of the bridge. We can't fix that problem anyway, you know, whatever put you up there. What we can do is let you know that you're important to us, that this is something uh, you're considering doing something that we really wish you shouldn't, uh, wouldn't because we'd like an opportunity to help you go on with your life, etc. and so forth. Uh, there'll be plenty of time later on after we've got you off the bridge to talk about some of this other stuff if we go there. Uh, so if you've ever been in uh, that type of crisis situation, they're not doing a background check on you. They're not gathering data uh, to make a diagnostic impression. They're trying to connect with you and to let you know that they care about you and that they care what happens and that you're worth something and that you're important and, and that sort of thing. Uh, Oh, I've already talked about that. <laughs> I just finished, uh, uh, and that's uh, and that's with a Rogerian approach. These two guys came along uh, uh, later on. They uh, came a little over twenty years ago, I guess. Now uh, came up with uh, uh, an approach they call motivational interviewing. Uh, this is uh, uh, Bill Miller right there, and this is uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Rolnick, who's a uh, He's English. I don't know if he's still in America or not, but uh, Miller is. Uh, the um, uh, and they came up with an approach that is person-centered, uh, but it is not non-directive. In fact, it's consciously, although mildly, uh, directed and directive in most cases. Uh, they too uh, are, uh, and this is a, a, an approach that is widely used uh, in the treatment of uh, substance abuse disorders. And you can find this employed in groups. And Rogers uh, counseling is uh, Rogerian approaches. The person centered counseling lends itself very well uh, to working with support groups as well as individuals. Motivational interviewing is uh, mildly, uh, like I said, but very self-consciously directive. It is client-centered. It can be used very effectively in brief interventions, and I'll show you a little bit about that in a little bit. Uh, and it was initially developed for so-called resistant clients or alcoholics. Now, uh, Miller, and for that matter, Rolnick too, I think, Miller, for sure, uh, discounted the idea that there was even such a thing as a resistant client. Uh, that what we call resistant in, uh, in, uh, uh, in counseling is a skill issue on the part of the counselor. Uh, that the client is only responding to what you're doing. And if he is being resistant, then that's because you are not interacting him, interacting him, interacting with him. <sighs> Thanks, preposition. Uh, <clears throat> interacting with him in a way, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been doing this a lot today, so uh, lecturing, I mean, my voice is kind of tired. Uh, the, so that what we're looking at is a, a, a client, as a counselor, who is not proficient at rolling with resistance. And rolling with resistance is, uh, is important. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Like psychological judo. Uh, am I relies upon asking open-ended questions. Uh, it's not, uh, how much do you drink? You might ask, what is it about drinking that appeals to you? What do you like? You know? uh, and that requires the client to engage himself, to engage. And I'm using him as just a pronoun habit with me, ladies. I'm not being sexist or anything like that. Uh, I'm trying not to be anyway. Uh, just, just old habit. Uh, uh, Reflections that function as questions, so that when you uh, 
uh, Micah statement or, uh, or make an uh, empathic response, then she can, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, engage uh, before answering, uh, before responding to you. And the whole point of that is to get the client into arguing for change, because it should be them. If we're going to have a discussion, if we're going to have an argument, right, and, and, and motivational interviewing says we should avoid arguing whenever we can. Uh, if you come into my office and sit down in front for me, uh, and I tell you, uh, you know, oh, I see here you got busted for uh, uh, for uh, possession of marijuana. Don't you know marijuana is illegal and that you could get in this kind of trouble for that? Don't you know that it's wrong to drink uh, while driving and that the police will get you, etc. and so forth? You're inviting that uh, I'm inviting you to fight with me. And not only am I inviting you to fight with me, I have already picked my side. And because I'm going to argue with you that you need to change and lecture you that this is what you need to be doing by default, if you're going to respond to me, you have to argue the other side. And next thing you know, we're knocking our heads together. And the counseling begins, you are, uh, becomes a, you are too, I am not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Uh, and we're not going to get anywhere with that. We're not going to get anywhere with that. Underline that. <laughs> you know, uh, when... Someone comes in, they might sit down across from you and say, look, Mr. or Ms., counselor, person, you, uh, I don't know why the damn judge sent me here, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm not an alcoholic, and you can talk all day, and I'm still not going to be an alcoholic. And I've had uh, my conversations begin that way a lot. To which I respond, I don't know you. Uh, I really don't have any intention of uh, uh, talking of calling you an alcoholic. Um, you know, it's way too early to even think about that kind of stuff. I just want to get to know you a little bit, uh, and you know how you wound up here, and and what you want to do now that now that you're here. So could you tell me a little bit about yourself, and, and engage it that way? Uh, a thing that I discovered a long time ago. Uh, is that confrontational uh, techniques uh, are unpleasant and they don't work very well uh, with people. I dread going into an office uh, or going anywhere uh, where I know that what's coming next is going to be people challenging me on whether what I'm saying is true or not or how I view myself or whatever. Uh, and that's just me. Uh, you know, but I'm not unique. Uh, I'm not unique in that. Uh, so I try to diffuse that as much as I can. I'll invite uh, people to talk about uh, uh, to talk about themselves. I'll try to elicit change talk. Uh, have them telling me why they need to quit using telling me how they can benefit from sobriety. Telling me what they want to do with their lives. Uh, rather than trying to um, fit down some kind of a, a formulaic behavioral blueprint on top of it. And roll with resistance, you know. Uh, that's moving people in a direction that you want them to go. Uh, 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 Miller calls it psychological judo. Judo is a, a peaceful martial arts form. Uh, you don't pe beat people up with judo, you just don't let them beat you up uh, so that you use their force. If they try to smack you, you just use their force to move them away from you so that they can hit you. Uh, that's interesting, huh? Uh, so you roll with resistance. You don't meet it head on because then you're butting heads. And if you spend uh, any time in your counseling session, arguing with your client is wasted time. It's just wasted time. You'll get into this 
a lot deeper in your communication skills class uh, if you're taking it with uh, uh, with Mr. George this uh, semester. Miller and Rolnick also identified some stages of change, and you may have seen these already. People talk about these in other theories. This is this is something that's become part of a modern technical eclecticism, and it's and and rightfully so because it works and it's a uh, it's a good way of of thinking about things. Every human being that you encounter in your professional life is a client or as a potential client, or as a family member of a client, or as a, a prevention uh, client, those of you that are leaning that way. Uh, uh, Pre-contemplation is their first stage. Uh, what, you know, when I first started getting high, and I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I bet some of you could raise them too. Uh, when, when we started getting high, uh, I didn't think about, man, I wonder if I'm got a drug problem, or if I'm having a drug problem, or what this is doing to me, if this is messing my body up and stuff like that. I didn't think about it. Uh, things I thought about when I started smoking weed, and I know exactly why I started smoking weed, and she was about five foot two, a little cute blonde named Candy D. Uh, and, uh, you know, if she wanted to sit in the backyard and eat dirt with a teaspoon, I'm cool with that, as long as I could do it too. Uh, the uh, uh, I didn't think about it. I thought about other things. Um, I thought about fitting in with friends. I thought about having a good time. I thought about how good this felt. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, those were the kind of things that crossed my mind, if anything crossed my mind. If you were to run across me while I'm sitting out in Candy's backyard, uh, she and I... Uh, 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 looking up at the night sky and splitting a doobie, uh, and you said, hey, Howard, uh, you know, have you ever given much thought to what that drug's doing to you and how you might ought to quit and that you may be building a dependency, et cetera, and so forth? Uh, the answer would have been a rousing hell no. Why would I think about that? Why would that cross my mind? When I started drinking, I didn't think, hey, man, I think I'm becoming an alcoholic. Uh, that really snuck up on me, by the way. We'll talk about that maybe in another course somewhere. Uh, but stuff happens, and uh, over time, uh, you know, maybe things do happen, and I have to stop and go, wow, wow, I've got a DWI? What's that about, you know? Uh, or, oh, wow, I'm in the hospital, I overdosed on something, oh, wow. Uh, or the judge uh, says, look, dude, I, I'm really leaning towards giving you anywhere from five to seven years, but I'm going to give you a chance here uh, to go to this program. And it's like, oh, wow, how did I wind up here? Uh, contemplation occurs, and we start thinking about... Uh, uh, about our actions. And maybe we come to a determination uh, that we need to do something, uh, like stop, uh, you know, like uh, uh, not use as much, like try to control it, like practice abstinence or something. Uh, when I realize that there's a problem and something that, that I need to change, uh, usually I prepare for that. Uh, and I may prepare for it mentally. I may prepare for it physically. If you're going to, if if you uh, are uh, uh, considering smoke uh, smoking cessation, stopping cigarettes, you might employ a plan where you do a behavioral self management program, where you think about the cigarettes that you smoke, and you keep track of the cigarettes that you smoke, and you uh, cut down on the number of cigarettes that you smoke. Uh, all of that's preparation till you get to the action stage and you stop. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the preparation, by the way, has been a, a relatively new addition because in the first uh, schema of this that they came up with, you went from pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, to maintenance. Uh, so the preparation is a, uh, a, is a relatively recent wrinkle. Uh, in this uh, in this approach, uh, 
if you just contemplate, uh, well, I'll, I'll harken back to another old mentor of mine, one uh, Spencer Andrews, the late Spencer Andrews. He died a lot of years ago, but I still miss him. And, uh, uh, but he uh, told me that uh, uh, as long as you're contemplating, you're not doing anything. You're, you stay drunk a long time contemplating because the, uh, the, reco the recovery bone is connected to the ass bone and you've got to get off of the latter if you want to attain uh, the former. Uh, so the first thing you need to do if you want to stop drinking is stop drinking. Uh, and that's where you get into the action. Uh, and once you stop drinking or drugging, or gambling, or uh, sex addiction, or whatever, overeating, whatever it is that you're trying to do. Then comes the maintenance stuff. What do you do to maintain your benefits? What do you do to maintain your sobriety? What do you do to maintain the positive changes that are in your life? Right in this area, pre-contemplation into contemplation, we are very useful. Uh, to our clients to help them uh, uh, make a decision and a choice. And counseling is not a nice linear go from here, go to there, go from here, go to there, there. Uh, it's sometimes it's all over the place and it's uh, one step forward and two steps back, you know. Uh, you have to move out of pre-contemplation and into contemplation. That's one that... Uh, uh, you know, with your with your drug use, uh, for instance, your alcohol use. I went from pre-contemplation to contemplation. Uh, okay, I've had seizures behind uh, uh, drinking. I've had DWIs behind drinking. I've been put in jail for public intoxication. I get into fights. Uh, I can see all of this stuff that's going on here. Uh, so here I am, and uh, uh, now my sponsor says I have to give up weed. Er, do you hear those breaks? Yes. What do you mean I have to give up weed? Uh, weed's not a real drug. <laughs> you know, this is just something you do till you get real dope, right? Man, I don't ever uh, lose control when I'm smoking weed. I don't ever. Uh, I don't even like weed really all that much. I mean, it's kind of a boring drug if you think about it. You know, if you got some fairly good weed uh, and you, uh, you know, do a few hits, then next thing you know, you're hungry and horny and sleepy and stupid and you don't know which to do first. So uh, you take a nap. Uh, so the. Uh, you know, and the, that can't be a problem, you know. And I can't roll good doobies, and they look pregnant in the middle, and they kind of fall apart. And and uh, I couldn't clean the seeds out right. Back in the day, marijuana had seeds. Uh, and they'll pop and, uh, you know, burn my clothing and set me on fire, <laughs> stuff like that. And I only use it when girls got to come over because, uh, you know, I don't want them to use up all my cocaine. Uh, the... Um, that, that sort of thing. And so I hadn't given any thought to, uh, uh, to change in that particular behavior. Now my sponsor tells me, as he's nodding his head and listening to me, and with the very best Rogerian approach, he did a Millerian twist on me uh, when, it, when it came to his interpretation and his empathic response. He did a reflection, and he said, I hear what you're saying, man, you know, uh, you don't really like weed, you don't have a problem with it, the, the effects are, you know, you don't really appreciate the effects, you can't roll good doobies, you still have, you burn your clothing and the seeds pop and everything, and uh, you can't see yourself as really having a problem with this substance, but anything beats being sober. And I was nodding my head to he got to that last but, but anything beats being sober. And I said, Carrie, dude, I didn't say that. And he said, mm, yeah, you kind of did. Uh, and it pissed me off. But, you know, once I think about it, yeah, I kind of did. So uh, 
the role of the counselor in all of this is to help me through these stages and to tilt me more or less. I'm sitting on a fence. I could fall off either way. And this is my ambivalent mind, right? I'm of two minds. I want to want to quit. You know, I want to uh, uh, be sober, except I don't want to change, you know, and I'm back and forth. So change talk even is not a is not a commitment, uh, and I will waffle on this. So that a, a big part of what my counselor does, and a big part of what you'll be doing with clients, is to uh, encourage and reinforce them moving forward. There's that ambivalence working on that poor squirrel, uh, straddling the fence. Do I want in this yard? Do I want in that yard? Where's the pecan tree? To hell with it, I'll take a nap. Change talk is not a commitment, but it can lean to it. Ambivalence is having to mind, ambivalent. Uh, I want to be sober. I don't want to be cha uh, changed. It's the client who needs to argue for change. And you can do this in uh, ways. You can ask provocative, evocative type questions. Uh, where do you see yourself in five years if you don't stop using? How do you think your relationship will be with your wife, for instance, in five years? You know, she told you that uh, if you don't uh, find a way to get sober, she's going to leave, right? What do you think is going to happen? Uh, what will happen if you? Uh, what will happen if you don't change? Where do you see yourself if you do change? On a scale of one to ten, how how important is you, is it to you to uh, uh, to sober up? On a scale of one to ten, how confident do you feel that you'll be able to make these changes? Uh, and all of this is about tilting the person to falling off on the right side of the fence, to falling off on the healthy side of the fence, which is where we want them to go. Uh, and while we're doing that, we roll, roll with resistance. You have to develop a feel uh, for your clients. And this isn't fake. This isn't something that, uh, this isn't a manipulation that you're pulling on people. Uh, confrontation, there, I, you know, I'm not a purist. I believe that, uh, yeah, there might be times for confrontation with people, you know. Uh, and it can be done in such a way as you can step on their toes without messing up the shine on their shoes. Mr. George will teach you that too. Uh, but uh, confrontation is not something embraced by MI. Uh, if, uh, if you want to confront someone, then they're going to confront you back. If you push, they'll push. Uh, so we want to kind of lead them along, invite them along. Uh, if they are adamant about not wanting to do something, then we need to either move on to something else or reframe what's going on with them. And there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, and again, I'm going to pass that on to Mr. Jo Mr. George, double-sided reflection coming alongside a whole bunch of techniques that you can uh, use to move people in a positive way. Uh, without uh, stopping to fight. Rolling with resistance is, uh, again, is that psychological judo. You're using the client's energy to move them in the direction you want them to go. Motivational interviewing also lends itself to brief intervention, and so does Rogerian counseling, for that matter. Uh, remember, we talked about uh, uh, Rogerian techniques being utilized in crisis centers. Uh, well, uh, so are motivational interviewing uh, techniques. And crisis centers are usually brief interventions. If you're at suicide hotline, you know, you may talk to someone for an hour, maybe two hours. I don't know. Uh, and, <coughs> uh, and then... Uh, you're probably uh, done with them. You probably, you'll get them into some place, you'll have a referral for them, you'll move them on, uh, and you won't be working with them again. Uh, and MI uh, 
uh, lends itself, as I said, to brief intervention. And uh, brief interventions are you see people for one or two sessions and that's it. Uh, you may not see them for, you know, 15 or 20 minutes sometimes and, that, and, and that's it. Uh, there are a couple of things, and I put these on links, and uh, I'm going to make assignments on them. I haven't posted your assignments as of right now, but they'll um, but they'll be there. Maybe they're already there by the time you see this uh, video. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm still I'm still uh, speaking to you as if we're in synchronous time, and we're not. Uh, but there are links in the course room regarding uh, S. Burton audit. Uh, audit is the alcohol use disorder identification test and it was developed by the World Health Organization and I've got uh, uh, there's about a five minute video or so uh, at both of these uh, uh, there are two short videos on the uh, in the course room uh, showing you how to um, uh, what an uh, uh, audit looks like and how to conduct a, a brief intervention and referral uh, to treatment, which is the SBERT. Should have put the little uh, quotation marks around it and did the SBERT thing, but I was kind of tired and sleepy when I put that together. So, I, anyway, FYI, when you're doing these, when you're putting these together, once you use, one, it, you don't just jump out there with uh, that, you write it out and then you put the little uh, uh, abbreviation in there. I know what that's called, but I can't remember it right now. I'll get around to it. Uh, so the, these things are posted. Alcohol use disorder identification uh, test is a numerically scored uh, set of questions that you can either hand someone and let them fill it out, or you can sit with them and uh, and uh, ask them the questions, and you'll have the questions answered in a relatively short time. You can do this just in a very few minutes, uh, and uh, then it's uh, you look at the scale, and if it's below eight, there's uh, nothing. If it's eight to fifteen, then you do. Uh, 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 you have a discussion with the client. You tell them what the, uh, what the score indicates, and you basically give them advice and ask them questions. If it's higher than 15, then you may be looking at referral to treatment. Screening and brief intervention uh, uh, things uh, it can be done with or without the audit. Uh, the one that you're going to be looking at on the, on the site, and and these are uh, YouTube links, by the way. Uh, feel free to look through. Uh, there are many of them on there for you to for you to look at. Feel free to you know knock yourself out. You know if you're if you're curious about these and and how they're done. Uh, they got some how tos and how not tos as well on there. Uh, but this one is a brief intervention that a doctor is doing with a, a patient who's been in a vehicle accident uh, and was drunk at the time. And he does a brief intervention on him while he's in the emergency room in a hospital bed receiving treatment. Uh, and uh, this is a, a, a thing uh, that... Uh, uh, that uh, we've been pushing, or we being the treatment field and some people in the medical field, uh, for a long time with doctors and nurses. It doesn't take long to learn how to do this stuff. And if you're in an ER or an ambulance or if you're a cop, uh, at any of this, you can, you can talk to people in, in situations that uh, uh, where you have credibility, where you have access right now, and you talk to them about their drinking or their drugging and how and the relationship of uh, of the use and how it got them to where they are right now, and ask them if they'd like to do anything about it. 
uh, and as again, it's putting the ball in the in, in the individual's court. It's not a lecture. It's not a put down. It's not uh, any of that. It's just you know. Uh, and uh, in this particular one, he says, "You know, you've been in here before." I think this was this one. Uh, uh, you've been in here before. You've been injured before. Your your blood alcohol level was pretty high, you know, uh, and I'm concerned. You know that uh, uh, that uh, that that you uh, uh, may have a problem here. What do you think about it? And then he allows the client to talk. And again, remember, allowing the client to talk is a huge part of motivational interviewing. It's a huge part of Rogerian approaches to counseling. Uh, if we, if you have a 50 minute session, uh, with someone and 30 minutes of it was you talking, it was a lousy session, uh, because what you're supposed to be doing is listening and then, uh, uh, directing and interjecting. In conclusion, person-centered counseling is an effective and fast approach to, uh, building rapport uh, with the client. Uh, Person-centered counseling is incorporated into many substance use disorder treatment uh, approaches, and you'll be using these types of interactions. I, I hesitate to say techniques because they're more about interacting, and they're pretty organic. You don't walk in there with a, uh, you know, with a checklist of this is what I'm going to do here and there, uh, but uh, you uh, uh, pay attention. Uh, and your responses are directed by whatever's going on in this immediacy that uh, Rogers talked about. Uh, Espert and Audit have proven to be excellent prevention and early uh, intervention tools, and they give you some data that's immediate, hands-on, understandable, the client gets it, uh, etc. Uh, and MI is widely used in the treatment of SUDs as well as many other disorders. It's also a terrifically effective way of uh, uh, addressing some touchy issues with people, health issues like, uh, uh, you know, uh, sexual risk reduction for STDs, uh, uh, you know, addressing people who are trying to stop smoking, uh, lose weight. Uh, whatever. Uh, and these uh, have proven to be a, a effective with that. It's also a good way of giving people bad news, like uh, when you do uh, a, a screening, some use a screening tool like uh, the ASI or the SASE or Columbia or, you know, whatever is being used at the time. Uh, and have to tell people, you know, well, according to this, you've got a substance use disorder. Uh, I probably have some recovering people out there in the audience. I'm a recovering person. I'm very glad to be a recovering person. But when I learned I needed to be a recovering person, when I learned that, uh, you know, I'm an alcoholic, uh, I'm a drug addict, uh, Boy, was I thrilled. I felt like I had been sent to Loser Island to live with all these other lepers uh, with the big L on their head. Uh, I've gotten better. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it was a hard pill to swallow. And I'm pretty good at swallowing pills. But anyway, uh, that's that. Uh and I'm a little loopy because I'm tired and it's light where I am. So uh, the uh, uh, person-centered approach, motivational interviewing, uh, all of this is a way of being with people that uh, really, you know, is, is kind of comfortable. It's hard work, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, when you're doing... Uh, uh, counseling at this level and uh, interacting with people, it's, it, it's, there's an intensity to it. Uh, 
and you're having to pay attention to so many things simultaneously. You're listening to what the person's saying. You're looking at their eyes to see if they're making eye contact. You're watching their body posture. You're uh, checking out their gestures. You're listening to their voice inflections and all of this good stuff uh, simultaneously so that when you... Uh, respond to them, you know, you have a lot of data that's coming in, uh, observable data uh, about uh, what it is they're feeling, Uh, you know, whether they're telling you the truth or not, whether they're trying to level with you, whether they're trying to manipulate you, uh, you know, (laughs) uh, you get a lot of information there, and um, you have to respond to that, Uh, and people who uh, are good at this, Ah, they make it look so easy. You know, you watch someone who's an effective uh, uh, motivational interviewer and you go, ah, who couldn't do that? You know, everybody can do that. Uh, but, and it, you know, you probably can. <laughs> but it, uh, uh, when you get started, you'll find it takes a little bit of practice before you can uh, knock it out of the park, so to speak. Anyway, uh, You'll get a lot more of that in your uh, basic counseling skills class and an opportunity to practice as well, I hear. Plus, Rianne's a lot of fun, so there you have it. Um, Thank you for your kind attention, and I'll see you next round. Good night.